What's up? This is Serenity with Cascade Media Group, and we're down at the Blue Room on 18th and Vine with Jane Elliott. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing really, really well right now. Ask me in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been in Kansas City since Friday, right? I think so. Yeah. I've been somewhere since Friday. Yeah, I think we came in Thursday night, worked all day Friday, and now today, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, you spoke to Shawnee Mission West, Shawnee Mission East yes. on Friday, and I know um, because I was reading the article from the Kansas City Star, and you told them the future is an opportunity, and what we do in the next few years will determine whether we rise or fall. And I know last night at the Memorial Hall, you kept speaking about the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what did you mean by that? Statistics say that within the next 30 years, white pe white people will have become a numerical minority in the United States of America. Oh, wow. Therefore, it's extremely, extremely important that white people today treat people of col other color groups as the way they want to be, the way white people would want to be treated in the future. Because if we don't, if we don't behave ourselves in the present, we're constructing a future that could be extremely unpleasant for white people. We cannot allow this com kind of racist behavior to go on. We cannot allow people to elect more racist legislators. We cannot allow our leaders to say the kinds of things that are being said about color in this country. We cannot continue to perpetuate the racist behaviors and the racist policies that we have perpetuated, perpetuated in the past. This stuff has to stop. If for no other reason, white people have to realize that white people are frightened right now because they're afraid that in the future, people of other color groups are going to treat, treat us the way we have treated them. Mm -hmm. And That's my right. message is, change your behavior toward others in the present so that you can tr construct a future that you will be comfortable in, in the future. This is ridiculous. We are, we are building our own walls every day. We build walls every day. Well, they're talking about building a wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're big on walls in this country. We know exactly how to build them. Right. And we know who, who we're going to build them to keep out now. And it's going to be brown-skinned people. We don't want brown-skinned people in this country because, as a couple of people have said, they reproduce too rapidly. So we've got to increase the white, white color group, but we call it the white race, which is a lie. There's no right. such thing. But we want to increase the white color group in order to avoid being a minority. You can't do it, it isn't going yeah. to work. That was my next point. Um, you spoke about uh, yesterday at Memorial Hall about the birth rate for Caucasians in this country. Um, what was the name of that book you were speaking from? I didn't get the, you said there was a book you read that we talked about that was the biggest danger the to. Birth dearth. According to Ben Watt. What's it called again? The birth dearth, B-I-R-T-H-D-E-A-R-T-H, which means the lack of births. Oh, okay. Yeah, and according to Ben Wattenberg, who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute and an advisor to presidents of the United States, mm -hmm. a brilliant Jewish male, but he said in the first paragraph of the book, The Birth Dearth, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. Wow, if okay. We fix this and do it now, white people will become a numerical minority and this will no longer be a white man's land. I'm infuriated by that because this has wow. never been a white man's land. You ask any Native American, right. and they'll say, no, this land doesn't belong to white people. This isn't a white man's land. This, is, this, is, this land was provided for us by the Great Spirit, and we better start taking care of it. We white folks don't take good care of things. And I liked your explanation of when you said something about the spirit, about technically if you went back in time, the first people would be a black male and no, a white. No, 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 no. The first people would be black females. Right, right. You did say you mentioned that, yes. Because black females could reproduce but you, asexually, but black males can't right. do that. You brought up the creation story. That's what it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in the creation story, <laughs> the first man according to the yeah. creation story, which we, which we Christians, especially white Christians, just love the creation story. Yeah. But because we don't delve into it too deeply, mm -hmm. we, you know, we just take it at face value. But face value is what it's all about. Because in the creation story, the first man was made out of dirt. Well, in right. order to, for dirt to be fertile. In the Garden of Eden, it had to be made out of rotted vegetable material, which turns black as it rots. Right, so the right. first man was undoubtedly a man of color, and the first woman was made out of Adam's rib. Well, all bone tissue is white. So the first <laughs> yeah. couple was a mosaic couple. It was a black man and a white woman, which just tickles me to death. But not everybody is pleased when I say that. Fact, yeah, we... <laughs> quite irritable, quite... quite um, now you've done it. And then, and then we say, and God, man made, God made man in God's image. Mm -hmm. because, so that means that God must be 
a white male, according to white folks. But mm, yeah. God made when it says God made man in God's image, it doesn't mean that he make that God made somebody to look like God. It means that God imagined something walking on two feet without feathers, mm, with yeah, okay. a, a, a thinking brain. God imagined human beings. God also imagined the boa constrictor, and he all God also imagined the aardvark and the kangaroo. Mm, right. None of which look like God, because God is a spirit and has neither gender nor color. But we, but we white folks. <laughs> want to make them we, white. <laughs> we change when we come into a new environment. We immediately change the environment to fit our needs. Mm. When people of other color groups come into a new environment, they immediately change their needs to fit the environment. And I never thought about that and until you said that. Look around you and look around of what people w- did with this country, with this land, before we white folks got here. So basically you're saying we, we are okay with conforming and white people automatically conform things to fit them. We, we white people force others to conform to us. Right, right. We don't have to conform. We expect others and the land to, con- to conform to us. And this is wrong. We've got to fix this. One of the ways we fix it is by protesting what's happening with that pipeline in North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. I'll be there pro- protesting that. Because as my son, who is a, a, operates large equipment, says, Mom... They build bridges over rivers all the time. Mm -hmm. They could raise that pipeline over the river, just like they do in Alaska. And in Alaska, they put put the pipeline pipeline up high enough so that the the animals can, it doesn't mess up their migration paths. He said, they could take that over the river. What's the problem? Oh, well, we didn't think of that, did we? I suspect that engineers haven't come to that conclusion yet but i'm sure there are a whole mess of them out there right now with their pencils right. <laughs> and, and, and drawing drawing pictures to prove why we can't do that mm-hmm. well then you need to explain all these bridges to me that carry huge amounts of traffic and huge amounts of weight and do not destroy the river below them well there were so many things that you touched on yesterday but for the essence of time um i want to go into when you talked about when martin luther king was assassinated and you said something that I thought was powerful, and you said that he was hope to you. You said holding on to positive energy. And then you that started you moving towards your experiment. Explain to people how you felt and then do next steps after that. Martin Luther King to me was, uh, meant hope for this country. Mm-hmm. And for me, hope is an acronym for holding on to positive energy. He held on to positive energy, no matter how ugly it got. He held on to positive energy, even though he knew he knew he was going to die. He knew they were going to kill him after he did the Poor People's March on Washington with all those white poor people. He knew that he had to go. He signed his own death warrant. I, when I found out that he was dead, it was it was worse than when JFK died for me. Um, it was it was worse than when my father died. Mm, wow! Because here was a man who was willing to sacrifice everything for everybody. He wasn't just about white, black people. Yes, he's for everyone. Yeah. He was about everybody. And I had to explain that to my third graders in all white, all Christian, Riceville, Iowa, who had never been in the, in the presence of a person of a color other than the white color group. And I didn't know how to do it. So I decided to separate my students according to the color of their eyes, as Hitler did. One of the ways you got thrown into the gas chamber was by, was by having brown eyes during the Nazi regime. And, and that's what I did the next morning. I went into my classroom. We discussed this horror on television, the fact that Martin Luther King Jr., one of our heroes of the month in February, was dead in April. And then I said, would you like have any idea how it feels to be other than white in this country? And of course they didn't. Right. I said, would you like to have that experience for a day? Well, yeah, that, that sounded like fun to them because they didn't know, they had no idea. <laughs> So I said, okay, today we're going to judge people by the color of their eyes. Mm, wow, and that's powerful. And blue-eyed people, since they're in the majority here, they aren't as smart as brown-eyed people. They aren't as clean as brown-eyed people. They aren't as civilized as brown-eyed people. And immediately, immediately, within three and a half to five minutes, mm-hmm. I had changed the tenor of that classroom. I bet. And I had created a group of people who acted, I now realize, the way I do as a white woman. Well, not anymore. You don't act like that no, anymore. No, this is really, yeah, you can't, after you go through the exercise, and after you do the exercise, 
You can never be the same because you've literally changed your brain. Mm. Literally changed yeah. your brain because you see things in an entirely different light. I watched my brown-eyed students become what white adults had modeled for them. Mm -hmm. And I saw myself in them and I couldn't stand the sight of it. I was just sick at the thought that, okay, that's how black people see me on a daily basis. So I had to change what I am and I had to change what I had been. I, I didn't change what I had been taught. My father said a fair thing is a pretty thing and a right wrongs no man. Mm -hmm. So it might inconvenience you, it might ang anger you, but if it's right, it won't wrong you. He really believed that and that's the way he lived. And I thought I did too. I thought I was doing the right thing. And then I saw my students become me, my brown eyed students become me. And I realized what they were doing. It was absolutely devastating. And I watched my blue eyed students become in their behaviors what we have stereotyped blacks as being. Wow. It was just terrifying. I watched kids who couldn't read, brown eyed kids who couldn't read become readers. Mm. I watched blue eyed kids who could read the sixth grade level become unable to achieve academically. I couldn't believe it. And, and every, every year after that when I did it, I did little 10 item tests two weeks before the exercise, each day of the exercise and two weeks after the exercise to see if what I thought I was seeing really was happening. And what was happening was indeed I was changing children's learning ability. On the day they were on the top, they sailed. Mm -hmm. On the next day, even though they had been on the top, the first day, on the day they were on the top and they, the, the top, they dropped down to a level below what they had been two weeks before. Wow. And, and at, after two weeks after the exercise, they worked at a level higher than that before the exercise and much closer to that when they were on the top in the exercise. What I did with that, I realized that what I was doing was changing their brains. Yes. I was literally changing their brains. You tell a child he can succeed, you study how that child learns, you mm -hmm. teach according to his needs and not according to curricular needs, and you can change that child's achieving and his ability to achieve. And I, I, I had taken all the psychology courses. I thought I knew about expectations, but I didn't know until I did that exercise. Wow. And I, uh, my teaching would never be the same. My attitude will never be the same. And my life will never be the same because uh, I am probably <laughs> the, most, the most ignored person in Howard and Mitchell County, Iowa, <laughs> probably in the state of Iowa, because they, they, they work extremely hard to see to it that they don't notice me. Mm. So you toured the American Jazz Museum, you saw a, docu a documentary about 18th and Vine, and we're in the Blue Room, yes. so what do you think about 18th and Vine area? I think, oh my God, look at what we've lost. Mm. Look at what we haven't paid attention to. Look at what the white population has managed to ignore at their own peril and at, at their own loss. The things that, that are here that as a child I was never allowed to realize and as a, an, a teenager I was never allowed to appreciate and as an adult I was never allowed to discuss or to recognize in a positive way. This is not the story and this is not what you hear about blacks in the majority of the population in this country. Right. We have been exposed to all the negative stereotypes and none of the positive ones. I just think this is an absolutely remarkable and wonderful and educate, this is an education. Yes, it is. People who come in here, this is an educational institution right here. You've got, you've got a year of education right here. Yes, we and, do. And people, you know, beginning teachers should have to go through this. Wow, yeah. Well, you heard it from her. Thank I mean, you. This is, this is what he, an educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. That's what this institution does. It leads people out of ignorance. Every child, every teacher should have, every educator should have to go through, should be in, inquired to and required to go through this museum. This is absolutely remarkable. Yes, it is. Yeah, it, there's, no, there's no other word for it. It's remarkable. Thanks and for it has existed all this time. And this, the only thing I'm, you're missing is Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit. Mm, yes. Oh, you have to get a copy of that. Because white people don't know. We don't know because we don't have to. Right. That's one of our major freedoms, is the freedom to be ignorant about those who are different from ourselves, even though they are fantastic. All right. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Serenity reminding you to spit your peace. I'm Aya 
BB Bikini Pro Cat Williams, and when I'm not working out in the gym, I'm searching the web on Cascade Media and What's Up Kansas City. So make sure you check them out.